Welcome to another episode of In The Zone. I am your host, Chris Broussard. We got another fantastic show, man. Old and Polynese, 15 year NBA veteran, stopped by and has stories upon stories upon stories. You got to hear this interview. And then of course, we have Jason McIntyre for Knockdown Jay. You know that's always gritty. But first, as always, we're gonna hit you with the top five postseason player power rankings. And at number five, James Harden. I know he's catching all sorts of flack for going ISO crazy against the Golden State Warriors in game one. But look, he produced 41 points, seven assists, on 58% shooting. I mean, they didn't lose because Harden wasn't sharing the rock. They lost because the Warriors are flat out better, period, the end. Besides that, other than Harden, the rest of the Rockets shot 40% from the floor. You can't win that way, especially with Golden State shooting 52%. Look, was Harden perfect? No, but he was good enough to be in the top five. At number four, Al Horford. Look, I'm gaining more love and respect for Big Al by the game. He is getting it done. Always been a true professional. Everyone's known that, but now he's showing that he can be a star when necessary. In game one against Cleveland, to open up the series, 20 points he puts on him. Game two, 15 points. You need me to hit the boards, coach? 10 rebounds all while anchoring a stellar Celtics defense that's held Cleveland's great offense to just 88 points a game. At number three, LeBron James. Yes, falling down from number one the last two weeks. I know he went ballistic on the Celtics in game two with that great 42-point triple-double, but in game one, I actually had to give him an F for a grade. Only 15 points, seven turnovers, didn't get his team out of the gate well. LeBron also hasn't exactly gotten it done on the defensive end. He's been coasting badly on that end and it's hurt the Cavs quite a bit. So I have faith in the King to get the Cavs back in this series and actually get them back to the finals. But to do that, he's gonna have to keep playing like he did in game two. At number two, Jalen Tatum. Listen closely, Jalen Tatum. That's right, in the zone is throwing you a curveball. It's a mixture of Jalen Brown and Jason Tatum. I mean, how in the world do you expect me to pick between these two guys? They are both playing phenomenal basketball. They're actually defying conventional wisdom by being the leading scorers of a team in the playoffs that gets all the way to the conference finals. Tatum is averaging 18 points a game. Brown is averaging 17. Check this out. Jason Tatum is the youngest player ever. Not LeBron, not Michael, not Kareem. None of them led their teams in scoring at 20 years old in the playoffs and got to the conference finals. Tatum's the youngest to ever do it. Gotta give him props for that. And then Brown has been phenomenal of late. 23 and a half points, seven and a half rebounds a game against Cleveland in these finals. Look, Magic Johnson, you think about him as a rookie and you say, well, he did what Tatum's doing. You know, he was great in the finals when they won it in 1980. But Magic had Kareem Abdul-Jabbar in the middle of his prime to lead that team. Jason Tatum's best teammate, Kyrie Irving, and second best teammate, Gordon Hayward, are out. He is doing it as a full-fledged rookie who should be a sophomore in college. Jalen Tatum at number two. I don't care if you don't like it, those two are doing damage. And at number one, Kevin Durant. I have long said that I think Durant is the Warriors' best player, but Steph Curry is their most important player. I still tend to feel that way. However, in the playoffs, Durant is showing that, hey, in the second season, I'm the leader of the Warriors. Last two seasons he's been there, Steph led him in scoring in the regular season. The two postseasons, Durant has led them in scoring, averaging 28 points last year, 28 points this year in the playoffs. And here's the thing. In the playoffs where teams can better prepare for you, they have more time to study your film, to get ready for you, to know your offense like the palm of their hand. They know where you're going. They know what you want to do. It's easier to stop you. 
You need a player that when all else fails, when they know what's coming at them, I still can just beat you one-on-one. -on -one. Steph can obviously do that, no doubt about it, but KD is seven feet tall and he is killing people. You can't guard him. Can't put a small guard or forward on him. Can't put a big man on him. He is doing damage and I like it he's doing it old school with the mid-range jumper. In this day and age when it's all about the tray, KD is showing you Keep working on that mid-range jumper, kids. He is destroying Houston and all the other teams with that shot. KD, number one in the postseason player power rankings. <laughs> all right, we have my man, <laughs> Olden Polynese. How you doing? I'm good, Chris. Welcome How to you In doing? The Zone. I Thank see you, you all around in L.A. I see you at Starbucks <laughs> at and Ladera Heights. At good places. At good yeah, places. At good places. At good. <laughs> that, I do. That's true. I see you at good places. Yesterday, we had a health food store. Yep. Uh, I see you at Starbucks and Ladera Heights playing chess, yes. which you tell me you like the best I, former NBA chess player out there. Well, I don't know what everybody else is, <laughs> but all the ex-NBA guys I played against, I beat up on them. So, so who, who are some of them? <laughs> uh, all of them. <laughs> the, the guy on my list right now is Paul, Paul Pierce. Well, you want to play him, right? Yes, I want to oh, play you him. What you heard, he's list. nice? He, he stood there and watched me play. He didn't want was to play. Was it at that Starbucks? No, okay. it wasn't there. It was at a friend's house. Okay. So I'm like, I'm ready for you, Paul. Come on. Well, he was talking mess. <laughs> of, of course, course he That's was. That's what he did. Yeah. Okay, okay. So we'll, we'll put that together. We'll put that together. But look, you spent 15 years in the NBA with five different teams, uh, had a very solid career. I want to go to something, though, that a lot of people don't know about you. You did not walk until you were four years old. And yeah. you didn't, your, your family, I guess, couldn't afford a crib or something. So your dad <laughs> carried you around? Carried me everywhere. So was, that was in Haiti? That was in Haiti. So um, tell I me was about born, that. I was basically born with my feet turned inward. And first of all, people got to understand, any kind of condition like that in Haiti, <laughs> you know, you're pretty much yeah. done. Yeah, You know, yeah. we don't have the best medical staff in the world. <laughs> and so... But, at, you know, growing up, I didn't know any of this stuff. So I just remember my dad carrying me around and my mother rubbing oil on my legs all the time. Uh -huh. I do have those recollections. And so I had a brace on for the first two years. And then and that was supposed to straighten them it, out, straighten them out and keep them together. And then the next couple of years, just learning how to walk. So and the so brace did work. It did work. OK. And, <laughs> and and then, I always and, tell people the furthest thing from my mind was being an NBA player. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I bet. And, you know, you just I just want to walk. Yeah. I, yeah, I watch yeah, the little yeah. kids running around. You know, I watch yeah. my older brother, he's running around. I'm like, why can't I run? Why can't I walk? Wow. So it was at four that you started walking. Yeah, at four years old. And then you moved to Harlem. Yes. At eight years old? Uh, yep. Yeah. Uh, my dad came to the U.S. in 1968. My mom came in 70. And then me, my sister, and my younger brother came in 72. Now, when we saw each other yesterday, we are in the health, soup, health food store um, in Los Angeles, and we bump into Rick Ross. The real Rick the Ross. The real one, yes. The real Free not, Ray Ricky Ross, not, rapper, not the rapper. <laughs> he actually had a shirt on that said... The real Rick Ross is not a rapper. I don't know if you read it. But, um, you know, we talked with him. We took pictures with him and stuff. Um, but you, one of, he's one of the most notorious gangsters in black American yes. history. Uh, another one, Nicky Barnes yes. in Harlem, who was in the movie American Gangster, yes. even though he wasn't the star of it. You knew Nicky Barnes Yes, I up. did. Growing up as a kid in Harlem, you know, we used to go to the candy store that he had. Candy store, <laughs> <laughs> laundry mat, laundering money yes, mat. Yes, <laughs> you know he had on Frank Lucas, of course. And again, being a young kid, you know, I'm like 10 years old, 11 years old. I don't know what's going on. Yeah. I, I'm seeing a candy store. We actually buying candy, yeah. you know. Or oh, when we're playing basketball, as I got older, you know, the fact that I was getting money from him. You know, when we won a game. He would pay you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and so it's like, but none of that stuff was illegal to us. It was like, hey, you know, we're getting, um, giving money for, you know, doing a good job on the basketball yep, court. Yep, so yep. to me, yeah, you know, it was fun because, like I said earlier, it's like they were all celebrities because we saw them. We saw the big Cadillacs. We saw mm -hmm. the money flashing and everything else. So it was like they walked out. Everybody basically just, like, stopped. And, you know, they controlled everything. Yeah, and yeah, it was, yeah. it was kind of cool in a way. Oh, I'm sure. As an adult, 
It's not cool. <laughs> <laughs> so you were like, man, owning a candy store pays, right? <laughs> it does, right? You're like, I'm going to own me a candy store. I'm to get me a candy store. <laughs> <laughs> so when you went, you went to Virginia as really a lot of people thought you were going, you were the next Ralph Sampson. You, were, you came right after him. Was there, did Nikki like want any, you know, anything no, back? Was there any no. attachments? That's the one thing I really appreciated by growing up in my neighborhood in Harlem. Once I started playing basketball, and I started at 16. I started in high school. I had a growth spurt between my freshman and sophomore year, about eight inches. Wow. And then all of a sudden, I started playing basketball. I learned how to play the game. And at the end of my junior year, I was already an All-American. Well, that's so, what, so, so you, when you say started playing basketball at 16, did you play on the playgrounds before that? No. Obviously, Harlem had a lot of playgrounds, Rucker Park and stuff. I lived right you, across the street. So you, you didn't. I know kids were out there playing. You didn't. We were out there playing baseball. We were out there kicking a soccer ball. So you had no interest in basketball? No, not at all. I had none. The first game I ever saw was in 1977. I saw the Marquette game. And yeah. then I saw Magic and Bird play in 79. Marquette, that was, was that Duke in the um, national championship? I can't remember who they I beat, believe, but, but they won the championship that year, yeah. Al Michaels. I mean, Al McGuire. Duke won 78, so, I think. Yeah. And so I watched a couple games, but I think it was when I saw Bird and Magic. I was like, hey, this kind of looks really? kind of cool. Okay. But you got to remember, being from Haiti, our parents were not about sports. So we barely went outside. And if we did go outside, one of our parents was always with us. Okay. They didn't allow us to go out on our own. Now, were most of your friends Haitian or you were just hanging no, with No, we uh, were like American the only home. Haitian in our okay. neighborhood, okay. you know, in, our, in the polo grounds. And so all my friends were American kids. But <laughs> you know what's so funny? It's like, I had an accent, and so it was like they always made fun of my accent, <laughs> and so it was like, man, I got, I got to fix this thing. <laughs> I can't handle people making fun of me all the time. <laughs> so did you, did you, you purposely work on your accent? I purposely worked on my speech to not have an accent, and that's why people now, when they talk to me, like, you have a New York accent. I'm like, yeah. yes, I do. <laughs> but I mean, I love my country. I'm yeah. definitely pro hate I'm still a Haitian citizen. Yeah, yeah. You know, I never changed over. Okay. And so, but. I think it was because, you know, you didn't want to be bothered. You don't want to be bullied and harassed by kids. So it's like it put that pressure on me to just at least get that taken care of. Yeah. So so you 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 said your coach uh, encouraged you to play once he saw how tall you were. Yes. You didn't really think about, oh, I'm tall now. Let me play basketball. It was more him. Listen, here's how it happened. He saw me in the hallway. You got you got to come try out for the team. I'm like, what team? He said the basketball team. I said, I don't know how to play basketball. He's like, you don't? I said, no, I'll teach you how to play. Well, my parents aren't going to let me play. So he's like, I'll talk to them. So he went and talked to my parents one day, and his speech was, Mr. and Mrs. Pawnees, if you let me teach him how to play basketball and he gets good enough, he'll get a scholarship and you won't have to play for college. The minute they heard, you don't have to pay for college, oh, yeah, you take him, take him, there. he play, he play. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Well, that, that changed the trajectory of your family, your whole family. Yes, it did. That's um, amazing. I mean, not just my family, but my country, Haiti. And, you know, I've been able to help so many people and help my family, help friends. So it really made a big difference in my life mm -hmm. because I don't know any other profession that I could have done, you know, within five years of learning it, earning, yeah. you know, the yeah. kind of salary I was earning, even though it's not the kind of money they're paying now. Yeah. But. It was it still was pretty good money for playing yeah. basketball. Yeah. What what things have you been able to do in Haiti? Oh man. Um, whew, man, what haven't I done? I've helped so many young kids um, live. You know, donate money. I had a foundation that I, um, we um, eradicating the certain diseases in okay. Haiti, bringing okay. clean water, um, um, paid for a hospital. Wow. Uh, what else? And that's the money that wasn't stolen. Because <laughs> <laughs> right. I used to send money because I had a guy down there and he was supposed to take care of everything. And like for two years, people are like, nothing's being done. And finally, I was like, you know what? I'm going to have to go down there and do it on my own because wow. I can't trust anybody right now. Wow. And so, you know, we, we've been able to help a lot of people, good, you know. Good, good. And so I'm very proud of that. You know, we've helped kids go to college here in the U.S., mm -hmm. um, find families. After the earthquake, we were like, you know, 
one of the groups that was helping people reconnect with their families because I ended up having to do the same with my dad because he was down there doing okay. the earthquake and then we were reunited on the Dr. Phil show actually. Oh, really? Yeah, so that was kind of cool. Wow, wow. Well, basketball, you obviously, at 16, you start playing. Your next year, you're an All-American. Yep. So how did you pick it up so quickly? Were you were you you naturally athletic? I'm Polynes, man. <laughs> Come on now. <laughs> Listen, I learned how to speak English in a year from watching Sesame Street and Electric Company. Did I you go to myself, school? No. So you, I, you I couldn't sat go to school you because speak English. I was I was ESL, you know, and so I had to learn how to speak English. Once I learned how to speak English, even with the accent. Uh, but I was always a good student. Okay. That was the thing. I used to get money in Haiti for doing my timetables oh, at like two and three years old. Really? Yeah. Two and three years old? At two and so three. So your mom taught you that early? Yeah, everybody taught me. Wow. You know? So your and parents so were big on education. They were big obviously. on education. That's okay. why I was afraid that I was n never going to play basketball once uh, Mr. Carey, my high school coach, talked about it because I was like, they don't they care about all that stuff. That. Yeah, it's yeah, about yeah, education, yeah. education, education. So... Again, I taught myself how to, uh, how to speak English, and when they showed me the concepts of basketball and what I had to do, it was simple. Wow. In my mind, it was simple. So you were killing guys right away? Right away. I learned how to play. I figured out, you know, I needed a, 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 a go-to shot yep. like Kareem. Yep. I didn't have a sky hook, but I had a jump hook. Um, I had the toughness already from <laughs> where I came yeah, from. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, so it, this stuff was easy to me. So you played three years at Virginia. Three years at Virginia. Had good success uh, individually and as a team. I know you led them to the Final Four. That's right, as a freshman. Yeah, yeah. And uh, <laughs> and Samson, they got to the Final Four, what, once? His junior year. I yeah, think. like they didn't have the team success they expected in the tournament yeah. under him. So that was huge when you brought them to the Final Four as oh, a freshman. My God. I remember that. Yeah, because, you know, I was the replacement. Yeah. And here I am. And they were questioning my toughness my freshman year. Because I got hurt, like, the first week of practice. Okay. We, we used to have to run three miles at 6 o'clock every morning. I'm not used to that. Yeah, yeah. We don't run in New York City unless it's from a mugger. <laughs> and so I'm like, hey. So casual running was not my thing. So what, the first day we did it, I stepped on a rock and bruised the bone in my foot. All of a sudden, the coaches are questioning my toughness. My teammates are questioning my toughness. Wow. And I was like, hold up, man. I'm really hurt. And pretty much from that moment on, I never got hurt again. Oh, yeah. You know? Officially. Officially. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that, you know, it, that grew. My toughness grew from that one because I didn't want people questioning my toughness. Okay. And so I played through everything. Even like with my hand injury, when I first got hurt, uh, this was my first and only injury in the NBA, significant injury. And I broke the bone in my hand on December 28th. I had the surgery on the 29th, and I was back on the court on January 20th. With a broken <laughs> hand. Yes. Wow. Same thing Kevin Love had, that he's out for like two weeks. <laughs> so you don't, you don't, uh, you, you look at some of these injuries today, and oh, you're like, come on, man. it's funny to me. I'm like, come on, man, just suck it up, man. Okay. <laughs> you can walk around with your hand like this when you get older. <laughs> right, right. So you were drafted eighth yes. by, the, by the Bulls. By the Bulls. In 1987. Traded immediately to <laughs> Seattle for Scottie Pippen. Yes. Now, I got to say this to you. I know we boys, so I can say this to you. I looked it up. Complex Magazine had that trade as the fifth worst trade fifth in NBA worst. history. Sports Illustrated said it's sixth worst. Mm -hmm. You have a different take on it. Of course I do. You think it was bad the other way. Of course it was. It was bad <laughs> so, for the Bulls, man. They would have had more championships. So, really? You know, come on. So, now. tell me. Okay. I didn't get migraines. You know, I didn't get migraines like some people, <laughs> <laughs> so I would have been there. I would have performed, but, you know, all jokes aside, you know, I still do think you can't look at it that way because coming out, I was the high-rated player. Yes. And no so question. through circumstance, if I ended up in Chicago, I may have turned out to be the next Scottie Pippen. What do you, you know? I'm going to ask you, so it, let's say that trade's not made, you do go to Chicago, play with Michael Jordan. What do you think your career would have looked like? It would have been different. I mean, I would have been um, 
being spoken in, in the same terms, I believe, because I would have had a guy like that. I could have played off of Michael Jordan as great as he was. Mm -hmm. I would have been like Dennis Rodman, how he is, yeah. or how he was. I would have been similar to that because I was a great offensive rebounder, so I want Michael to shoot the shots. You know, I'll go get the rebounds. Yeah. But the fact that I knew people would be concentrating on him, I can get so many rebounds just by my position, and knowing that they weren't about him and getting the easy baskets. Okay, okay. So you've thought about that, I see. Of course I have. <laughs> I mean, because I don't like when people do that. So it's like the argument of who's the best. You can't do that. You know, Bill was the best in his era. Wilt was the best in his era. Well, they were the same. They man. were pretty much the so same who was era. The but best? He was, between the two of them, I say that Wilt was the best individually, Bill was the best. Winning wise, yeah, no question. I think, but because like, Will would put Will like forty was the best and thirty on it, <laughs> forty points, thirty period. rebounds. The best player, even Bill would say that. Yeah, yeah. You know, so I, I'm not gonna say that Bill Russell is better talent than Will Chamberlain. No, but at the end of the day, if you want to talk about winning, they got to stop talking about Michael man and start talking about Bill Russell. So you, so you don't like the goat conversation? I don't like it because er, you can't. You can't compare the errors. You know, just like LeBron right now is the best in our game, I can't say, oh, he would be great or he'd be bad in another era. He's doing what he can do in his era. Let's appreciate for what it is. You know, Michael was great for his era. Kobe was great within his era. Yeah. And so that's how I look at it. It's like these guys did what they had to do, bottom line, because we can never go in a time machine and compare them, so stop doing it. So you said, you know, I was thinking about it because the GOAT conversation obviously is just ubiquitous right now. It's everywhere, Michael versus LeBron. And I think back, and I don't think that conversation was ever a big deal until recently. Yeah. You know, when LeBron kind of came up and of course. But Jordan million, was called the GOAT. Yeah. You know, when he retired, he was called the greatest player of all time. I think even when he retired his first time after just three championships. But then when LeBron came, it kind of became a discussion. I was thinking, as you said, if you look at eras, it's surprising. We, I don't remember. Now, maybe I'm wrong. I don't remember Magic and Bird. Obviously, they had the rivalry. Yeah. I don't remember the huge discussion about who was better just between those two. No, because they were going back and forth winning championships. And so they were basically tied together. It's kind of like Stockton and Malone. You can't say one without the other. Mm -hmm. And Bird and Magic mm -hmm. are the same way. You can't say Magic without Bird and vice versa. Now, and you so, played, of course, against them. Who, <laughs> who do you think was better? <laughs> Again. Now they were in the same era. Don't, don't you think how listen, about that with the era listen, talk? Listen, I'm going to give you <laughs> Olden Polynesian's take on this. Magic, yes, the showtime and everything else. I, I got to give the edge to Bird. I'm, I'm not going to say a name, but there's a phenomenal player today who agrees with you. I have to give the edge to Bird. I mean, he can get his own shot off. He can get his teammate. Basically, what Magic did, he was able to do, plus be an offensive threat all the way out to the three-point line. That's an incredible asset. They were pretty much the same size. Yeah. They were both slow. They were both, you know, they were <laughs> not both leapers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but Bird, that outside three, and they were both high IQ guys, but I, I got to give the edge to Bird, man. In the league at that time, do you – have a feel for who players felt was the, the better player between those two? To be honest with you, the black players gravitated to Magic and the white yeah. players gravitated to Bird. Yeah. yeah. You know? Yeah. And the people with sense could see the difference. <laughs> 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 you know, and it wasn't about color or anything else. Yeah, it was, hey, yeah. this guy hit can ball. Yeah. And that's why we used to always look at Birds like, hmm, maybe he's not white. <laughs> you know, in a, in a little bit of a way, because he's got a lot of swag. <laughs> yeah, before the world was really hot, yeah. Bird had swag. Oh yeah, he was the biggest. They say the greatest he trash talk talker. More trash than anybody I've ever seen in my life, Chris. We, I saw it firsthand. I was under. If I, if I can't yes, tell this yes, story, go oh my god. So we're playing in Boston. I'm on the bench at the time. We have Derek McKee. Who you McKee. with at that I'm time? I'm with Seattle. So, okay. We have Derek McKee, one of the top defensive yep. guys around. KC is coaching us, KC Jones, who had, oh, coached had coached Boston. Boston. Yeah. So 
he looks, he catches the ball on the left side. He catches the ball and Bird. looks over at our bench and goes, I'm going to take two dribbles right, cross over left. So we're all on the bench like, this dude's And Derek McKee real. is on And Derek's on him. <laughs> Don't let him do that to you, D. <laughs> <laughs> he takes his two dribbles, cross over, pull up jump shot. Wow. And looks over at our bench and we're all looking at each other like, <laughs> is he for real? It's like, come on, just like when we put Scott Webman on, you know, I don't know if you heard about that. It's like, don't, come on, that's embarrassing. Don't oh, put him yeah, on Oh, yeah, Bird me. said. Yeah, 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 don't put a don't, white don't, guy don't, on Don't put a white guy on Did me. he say that to y'all? Man, he talked more trash than any, I, I don't think anybody can talk trash like him. Really? And the fact that he's able to back it up made it that much special. And that he was white probably real Oh, job. that he's never came into play. Is the fact that he could back it up. That's what we looked at. It's like, this dude here is for real. Wow. Now, who else talked was a good trash artist? Jordan, I hear? Jordan didn't really talk. Jordan said mean stuff. You know, he said stuff that you're like, damn, man. That, that ain't right, dude. Come on. You know, he did something like that. Can you like give that. an example? Man, uh, he didn't do too much with us, but I know a lot of stuff he's done. I know the only thing he did to me, I started trash talking when I first played against him because I knew him in college. Okay, yeah, yeah. And right. so... First game, he shakes my hand, welcome to the league kind of thing. And I go set a pick on him, he punches me in the testicles. In the testicles? Yes. And I'm like, Ooh. wait a minute, I thought we were friends. <laughs> you know, stuff like that. But he'll say mean stuff to you, you know. It's like, just like, you don't belong here. You know, he said stuff like that to me, but it was off the court when we're hanging out. Oh, he's really? Just, he's really like that. Like, you know, he, ugh. Did you see it as him trying to get an edge? Because that's course. the legend is uh, yes. when he's he got you on the court. When we were playing edge. cards or whatever, he's always <clears throat> trying to get an advantage. Um, I still remember, you know, his famous line to LeBradford Smith after he had that great game. You know, Michael talking about, why should I respond to a guy wearing my shoes? Yeah. You know, yeah. so it's like it's stuff like that. But he's... He's a different cat. Are y'all still know? y'all still friends? I mean, hang? we're cool, sure. but you know, yeah. we've lost touch. You know, now yeah. that he's an owner, you know, he's yeah. big time and everything. But I trust me, like I always tell him, I remember. <laughs> <laughs> so you wouldn't. So there's nobody you say is the goat. I think all these guys are great. To okay. be honest with you, I think Shaq is great. Shaq was an incredible guy, incredible athlete. He changed the game. I believe that if he had made up his mind to just dominate, no one would ever be able to defend him. I do. I was one of the few yeah. people that could defend him, and I used to tell him, and I told him this, dude. Let me tell you something, man. If you ever decide just to like dunk on me, I, there's nothing I can do. What'd he say? He's like, yeah, you're right. <laughs> but it's like, and then he comes in the game. One year, he was in shape, in my opinion. That was in 2000. It felt that was like moving, first ring. It felt like moving. Or a, no. Yeah, that was his first ring. It might have been his first, first, yeah, yep, his first. first ring. It felt like moving, trying to move a building. Wow. Every part of his body was like, like steel. That's why, like Man of Steel, that was it at that time, in 2000. Yeah, is it fair? It's fair to say he, under, so people have said that he underachieved, underachieved. Even though he had four rings. Yeah, but he underachieved. Great. Yeah. Personally, he underachieved. Because every time you get a ring, it's a team thing. Yeah. But he underachieved. You know, Kobe was great. Kobe could have done a little bit more to ingratiate himself with his teammates, you know, but he's Do still you one put of the that, top guys. Yeah, well, because I, I, I heard stories with Kobe when he was younger. Yeah, like he, he was aloof with teammates. You, you heard and the stuff story like about that. me breaking up that fight, right? No. Between him and Shaq? Do share. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, he mentioned it when they did that um, the little. When they sat down. Thing, and yeah, talk. sat down, yeah. Well, that was in practice. That was at a practice, but it wasn't a team practice. It was. At, I was gonna say because you never played. No, with them. we were just summertime, <clears throat> you know, working out, and at Southwest College, and we're running up and down, and they just join back and forth, and you no know, one makes anything of it because that's what we do. Yeah, we yeah, talk yeah, trash. Yeah. All of a sudden, it's like this is my team. Now nah, this ain't your team. This is my team. This is my team. This is my. Okay, whatever. It's both of your teams. All of a sudden, whap! <laughs> There's Wait, a swing. So Kobe swung at Shaq. No, Shaq swung at him. So uh, let me let and me I'm get like, a little <laughs> let me get a little background. 
Was this while they were, had they already won championships together, uh, or it was during that streak? I cannot remember the year. I don't think they had won a championship yet. Okay, but they were both on they the Lakers. They were both on the Lakers. Mitch Kupchak is sitting over in the corner. So it was all NBA players. All NBA guys. You know, I'm working out with them because I'm trying to get on the Lakers. I'm trying to, you know, Okay, like, so I'm it was mostly to, Lakers playing. Uh, mostly and, and Lakers, some free yes. Agents. And okay. some other guys, yes. And so I'm like, okay. And they're on opposite teams? They're on opposite teams, drawing back and forth. Next thing I know, there's a swing. So I run over. Not run over. I take about a step or two, and I grab Shaquille. And Kobe, then all of a sudden, he swings. But I'm like, so y'all I can't hold Shaq <laughs> while he's swinging. <laughs> Somebody get him. Because <laughs> I can't let Shaq go. Shaq yeah. ready to kill him. I let Shaq go. I so don't. Kobe missed Kobe while missed. you were you were holding Shaq and yes, he still missed. And Kobe missed and Shaq's like trying to wrestle from me and I'm like, okay, I got to buy maybe like two more seconds of being able to <laughs> hold this big dude. And then I think Samaki Walker came and grabbed Kobe, and Mitch Kupchak slowly got him, <laughs> came over <laughs> and said something or whatever. But it was like, if that punch landed oh, on Kobe, Shaq. yeah, yeah. Did it come close to hitting Kobe? Really? Yeah. He would have, it might have changed his it career. It was that Brad Miller punch. Yes, yeah. It was I'm, that I'm one. glad that didn't land too. Yeah, it was one of those. And I was like, he angry. Wow. <laughs> you know, it's like, he angry right now. What, if you know, if you know, what was the genesis of all that? Testosterone. That's, That's it. That's all it was. Ego, from what I know with both of them. It was just their ego, getting the best of them. Now, I heard a story. I don't know if it's true. I heard that when Kobe was young, like really kind of right when he got with the Lakers, that Shaq would talk a lot of trash to him, you know, just in open runs. And, you know, Kobe don't like being talked down to. No, and he Shaq doesn't. thought it was more jokingly, and Kobe was taking it seriously. Yeah, but though. some people know how to take a joke, some don't. Yeah. And I don't think Kobe ever did, especially back then. Um I remember other situations, you know, like guys that I know that play with them, you know, we'll sit around and talk, and they said the same thing. It's like he's not one to take joking, you know, well. Yeah, yeah. And so I saw it firsthand with that situation, but it was like, come on, guys, it's it doesn't really matter. You guys are on the same team. It's one common goal, you know, but that's me with common sense yeah. talking. <laughs> <laughs> they weren't thinking with common sense. They were like thinking, you know, with their egos. Wow. Now, yeah. how do you compare, and I'm not asking who's greater, but just their games, Michael and Kobe, because they're very similar. They may be the most, the two similar guys. I mean, because Kobe patented everything after Mike. Yeah. And so, but at the end of the day, you know, Mike, I think Mike has the edge because Mike changed our game. Yeah. Kobe was the recipient of that. So I can't say that he was better than Mike. Yeah. You know, because if it wasn't for Michael, I don't know what would have happened. But Michael was is a one-of-a-kind talent because he came at the right time, mm -hmm. at the globalization of the NBA. Cable TV. Yeah, just and big. so he was able to totally dominate. And I think that's why we say he's the greatest of all times. But again, like I said, if we're talking about greatest, then we got to start putting down, okay, A, B, C, you know, subsections mm -hmm, of this. Mm -hmm. What makes him the greatest? Because if it's championships, then it's he's not it's the greatest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, if yeah. it's points, he's not the greatest. Right, right. <laughs> so what makes Sneakers. him the greatest? Yeah, <laughs> shoe sales. Now, nah, he's the greatest of that. <laughs> we know that for certain. <laughs> Uh, you played that ACC was a monster Ooh. back then because Lynn Bias was another one. Obviously, oh, he died Lord. tragically um, of the cocaine overdose on draft night. Yes. Um, if I've heard people say if he had lived, we know he got drafted by the Celtics. He would have played with Bird and those guys. That, that Jordan would not have become Jordan, or at least wouldn't have been the only he, dominant player. Like he owned Mike. He really he owned Mike in college. He now, Mike a, was good in he college. Owned, he owned a lot of us in college. <laughs> I remember we beat him. The first time we beat him, I blocked his shot, and he fell down. And there's a great picture of me pointing at him. Yeah, I was all on top of him. And I'm like, oh, Lord. I think I, <laughs> what I, just I woke up the beast. <laughs> Even though we won that game, and then we went down there to Maryland. Oh, my Lord, they destroyed us. He wow. remembered that block, and he came at me the Did he whole say anything game. about it? He didn't say anything about it. He didn't have to. 
You know, he just came out. He showed me in his game. <laughs> you know, I was still learning basketball, and, yeah. but I didn't know I shouldn't have done that. <laughs> <laughs> you don't wake up the beast. <laughs> so those were le lessons learned. But I personally believe he he would have superseded Mike. Whew. We wouldn't have heard about Michael Jordan as much. Mike probably would have become great, but <laughs> he he had the edge on Mike because wow. he was a better shooter. He was a better athlete. He was bigger and stronger. He was about 6'8". He yeah. was 6'8", like two. He was LeBron. He was a slimmer LeBron. Mm. Same body type, a slimmer LeBron, but with a jump shot, like already had a jump shot. He was a oh he was a beast. I'm and sorry. he went to Boston, so he and probably might have won. And I'm sorry for Jordan right fans out there. And I, again, <laughs> he would have he would have done. That's he saying done a lot. Him. He would have done him. I don't agree, but I'm gonna let you speak. He your did piece. him in college. All we gotta do is <laughs> well, go Mike look at the Well, Mike was ACC tape. Player of the Year. So I don't what? know if Lynn was there. At, yeah, Lynn would have been there. Yeah, at the Lynn time. was there. So well, he what? was younger though. Yeah. So you know what? what? Mike could have done him, but he did Mike. <laughs> Just like Ron Harper. Ron Harper used to give Michael well, fits before his injury. Well, he Ron didn't Harper outplay. Gave he, Mike, didn't, he outplayed Mike. Ron gave Mike fits before his injury. Hold on. Did he outplay Mike? He, he played Harper, him tough. Ron Harper gave Michael Jordan fits before his knee injury. So what you saying? I'm just saying. <laughs> there's certain people that gave him a fit. Mitch Richmond gave him fits. There's players that could that went at Mike now. Well, okay, hold on. <laughs> Playing him tough, giving him 23 while he gives you no, 33. No, I'm talking about they were giving him 30 and he didn't have the same numbers. Come on. Really? Now. Yes. There's people out there. And they were players that he did not want to see. What? Yes. I mean, there's a lot of guys that were afraid of Mike, but there were some a few that he was afraid of too now. Th who? Come on now. Who else? They, he did not want to see Mitch Richmond. I'm telling you that right now. Come on, man. Man, Mitch Richmond, with all due boy, respect, that to big Mitch. old head. He put that on Mike, swing it around. Mike was like, "Nah, I don't want to mess with that." <laughs> <laughs> now Vernon Maxwell played him kind of tough too. Vernon Maxwell played tough because Vernon was crazy. Yeah, yeah. Mike yeah. ain't want no parts of that <laughs> on any level. But my, how how Mike get it done like that then? Come on, he was, six, he he was six great. Right? He really was great. He had a killer instinct, and that is what separates Mike from everybody else. His killer instinct, his winning mentality. It's like he wanted to win at all costs by any means necessary. Mm. Mm. That was it. That's the difference. Do you do you know Ron Harper well? Yes. Do you know why he was traded from to, Cleveland? From Cleveland. Because to your point, to, I was living in Cleveland. Mm -hmm. I think he went to the Clippers from yeah. Cleveland. I was living in Cleveland when he was traded. And that Cavs team was excellent. They, they were Mark Price, Ron Harper, Brad, Brad Doherty, Doherty, Larry yeah. Nance, High Rob. Like, they could have beat. I thought they had the the. It was some personal stuff that went on. Yeah. You know, I don't know the details of that, but I do remember when he did get traded to the Clippers right before I got there, you know, and him making a comment that, you know, he's in jail. <laughs> and being with the Clippers. Yeah. yeah, yeah and yeah. so it's like when I got there, I was like, wait, well, yeah, ooh. <laughs> so that's what he was talking about. <laughs> it was a weird situation back then. What was it like, baby? Is that when y'all practice at like uh, I I I, listen, I can't remember. It was a high school. We found some, wherever we found. College or listen, something? wherever we found is where we practice. Wherever we could find. I'm like, wait, is this an NBA team? What were some of the places y'all practiced? Oh man, Southwest College. Um, so Salvation during the, Army. Salvation Army. So during the season, you had all types of different practice sites. Oh, yeah. Oh, man. It was weird. That's terrible. Yeah. Clippers. But it was it was fun, though. Stuff like playing that Playing for the was Clippers fun. or just the league? The, the league like, in well, general, Well, the league obviously. definitely was fun. Yeah. But playing for the Clippers was fun. You know, it kept you on your toes. <laughs> I bet. You, all the stuff I took for granted, I really ended up appreciating once I got to the Clippers in 91. Yeah. It was like... Oh my goodness. Us having our own practice facility in Seattle, that's kind of cool. <laughs> <laughs> they don't so once you here. leave the Clippers, then it can be, you can appreciate it. You'll appreciate you appreciate even more. You had, I think, your best individual season was with the Clippers, right? Uh, my first one, yeah. You had a great I've had, year. no, Sacramento was my best years, but it started with the Clippers. Okay. Because I was getting consistent minutes. I became a starter for the first time because yep. I was coming off the bench in Seattle. Yep. We had yep. too many great players.
Yeah, those are some X good teams. X-Man, Dale teams. Ellis, Tom yeah. Chambers. Those guys aren't giving up their minutes. Yeah, those are <laughs> some know. good teams. Now, you played in what I think is the greatest big man era ever. Shaq, Ewing, Elijah yeah, Wine, David Robinson. Mutombo, uh, Mutombo. Morning. La- yeah. oh, uh, young Tim Duncan, even. Young Tim Duncan. I want to ask Jack you. Jack Sigma, I caught a piece of him, How good was he? Because he gets, people oh. don't recognize how good he was. He was incredible. That up high here, yeah. you don't challenge it, he shoots it. You challenge it, he goes by you. It's kind of like that move and Mikhail's up and under mm-hmm. and That's Kareem Scott. Yeah. Kareem Skyhook is definitely the greatest move of all time. Yeah. I think Mikhail's is next and then Sigma's. And we had the, the play called the Sigma, you know? And so it's like can't you can't stop stuff it. like that, man. Who, they made it their own, yeah, and yeah. there's nothing you can do about it. Who would you say, who was the best big man you ever played against? Kareem. Okay. My first game was against Kareem. And I he remember was older that year, then. my rookie year. He was older then, but he was still kicking butt. That skyhook was still potent. Um, after him, I have to say Akeem Olajuwon. Better than Shaq. Oh, my two. Lord, yes. Really? I, okay. I could go Shaq. I didn't like it. Because he didn't it. have the, the moves. No, he didn't have the strength. moves. Um, I kind of could, I could guess what Shaq wanted to do, overpower me. You yeah. know, he wants to dunk, you know. Yeah, yeah. I used to frustrate him by just standing in front of him, let him run me over. Okay. You know, have um, Joey Crawford call the offensive <laughs> foul. <on him. laughs> I used to use that against him, depending on who the referees were. <laughs> you know, so how, you got to like, know stuff like you that. You know what they're going to call. I know what they're going to call, so I use it against them. Okay, you know? okay. But Akeem... He had inside, outside, the foot speed. He had the shake. He had everything. Akeem, by far, mm. one of the toughest opponents I've ever faced. David Robinson was tough, too. It was hard for me to defend people that were similar to me. Yeah. You know, in physical Athletic body type. And all. Yeah, oh, Lord. I had a hard time. With, I had a hard time with morning. I love, no, Matumba was my favorite to and go. you had the offensive oh. skills, right? Bernie Bickerstaff said, if I played against Matumbo, I'd be a Hall of Famer. <laughs> <laughs> All my career highs are against Matumbo. Why'd you like playing against him so much? Because <laughs> I just knew how to play against him. I just, I could have, it was so funny. I would look at the schedule, right? No matter what was going on, I had like three bad games, four bad games. I'm looking around to see, when do I play Matumbo? <laughs> when do I play Denver? Oh, there it is. Oh, I know I'm going to come out of my slump. When do I play Atlanta? Oh. <laughs> wow, wow. <laughs> I had 25 rebounds against him in like 31, 32 minutes. My career high. You know, I, it's like everything I've done is usually against him. Do you feel like your NBA career could have been better or should have been better? No, only be well, you know what? It's hard to say. It probably could have been better if I ended up on different teams. Yeah. You know, you were never on great. I was well, never, Seattle was a good team. Seattle but. was a good team, but we weren't great. Yeah. You know, when I left and all that, then Gary became Gary, yeah, Gary became Clay. the glove. Yeah. Sean became the rain man, you know. But it's like I always cut teams on the tail end. Like when I got to Detroit, Isaiah was already on the mm-hmm. decline. Mm-hmm. Lambia, Rodman was still good, but that's when he lost his mind. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. so, but I look at it this way. I did the best with what I had. You know, I wasn't the most talented guy. I didn't, again, I was still learning on the fly. When did you <laughs> feel like you got to a point where you were done you know, you knew the game of basketball. And you weren't kind of learning or feeling like around new to the game. When I got to Detroit, when I got traded from the Clippers to Detroit, that's when I think everything clicked for me. Okay. Not that first year, but the second year. I was number two in the league in rebound. It was the same year I broke my hand, and I mm. finished tied with Akeem, you know, for um, third third position. Yeah. And so. I th- well, second, third, whatever. You know how they do in golf, you know. Yeah, yeah. Because <laughs> Dennis was one. They had Akeem here and then me. So, okay, okay. But, I, you know, I, did, I finished the season with a broken hand. Wow. And so, to me, that's when it started because I learned from Isaiah. I learned from Dennis the year before mm-hmm. on how to approach the game. Okay. You know, how to check my ego at the door. And so, from that point on, I just played the game, you know. 
What was Isaiah like as a teammate, Isaiah Thomas? Because he he's reputed as a great leader. He and is. obviously he was a leader. He's a that great team. leader, great guy. He definitely was about team and he wanted us to be our best. You know, it as I the only story that I remember from all my dealings with Isaiah is this one. Um I can, you know, I have so many, like, these guys coming to my house and my mother cooking for them mm -hmm. and him eating a piece of my mother's chicken and pulling out money. It's like, here, Mrs. Polly, <laughs> best chicken I ever had, including my mom's, you know, <laughs> something like that. But I remember when I, my rookie year, I meet Isaiah Thomas, Magic Johnson, every, all these great players, Chuck Person, we're in Where Chicago. At? Okay. Uh, we used to have, you know, the Player Association have, like, meetings. Um, and so we went to Chicago for the meeting. I was a player rep. Back then, it was, it wasn't by choice. They it just was, make rookies. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> You're the player rep. <laughs> but I embraced it. I was like, oh my god, that's kind of cool. <laughs> so these guys are gambling. Okay. You know, and I mean, I'm not making. I make what three hundred thousand dollars my rookie year. So it's like I don't have a lot of money. So, but I want to be a part of this. So they rolling dice and everything else. And I still remember what he said to me. He says, um, do you want to gamble or you want to shoot dice? And I said, I want to shoot dice. Okay. And so all my money's gone. I think I lost like $700. I'm damn near in tears. <laughs> I got to be in Chicago two more days. I ain't got no <laughs> He took all my money. <laughs> So he pulls me over to the side, and these guys are still betting, and they're betting big money. He pulls me over to the side, and he goes, uh, remember that question I asked you? Do you want to gamble or do you want to shoot dice? And you said you want to shoot dice. See, I don't shoot dice. I gamble. Okay? And so I'm like, there's a difference? <laughs> <laughs> like, so, so he begins to do what most people do when they have the upper hand. He starts taking advantage of it. He goes, he starts counting out the money, right? 100. So you work hard for this money, right? All year. So he's you, counting out the money he's he He's counting out from the you. money that he won from Okay. You. All right. So you work hard for this money all season, right? You know, all the pain and everything is second 100. Okay. Um, and you just came here and gave it to me, right? I'm like, yes. <laughs> so what did I do to you? I said, you took my money. He said, no, I pimped you. Now you work for me. <laughs> <laughs> like, are you kidding me right now? So you take my money and I'm getting this? <laughs> so he finished counting out the money. He gives it back to me. And I'm like, oh, thank you. Thank you. It's like, if you ain't ready to gamble, don't get involved. And I wow. was like, okay, lesson learned. <laughs> you know, but I was like... I don't need all this, man. If you're going to give it to me, give it to me. <laughs> but, you know, he taught me a valuable lesson. Yeah, it's like yeah. sometimes you got to know your place. Yeah, yeah. You just have to know your place. Even though I wanted to be a part of that. You shouldn't have been involved. I in shouldn't that. have been involved. And that was the lesson I learned. Is that because, one, you may not have known how to gamble as well as them, or two, you weren't making the money that they were Both. making? Okay. I didn't know anything about. I was like, I just, I was just excited being in the room, so I felt like I should should partake. Yeah. You know. Yeah, yeah. And so, and that's never even been my style. I grew up in Harlem around drug dealers yeah. and everything. I never, I've never done drugs. You know. And so I know how to say no, but it's like it looks so fun at that time because <laughs> I'm like, oh my god, you know, that's Isaiah Thomas, that's Magic Johnson. <laughs> it's so cool, but. There's a price to pay sometimes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. so it was a it was a very good lesson. I heard back then, and you were, I guess, the beginning of your career. You were flying commercial. Oh yes. Now I heard stories that guys would be gambling in the airport on the plane in on the, the airport, sitting right there, parents and kids are running around rolling dice. Oh yeah. That's a big reason I heard why one of the reasons the NBA wanted to go to charters cuz it was like you can't just be they were all doing that money it. Cuz wow. you got to remember it's what else are we going to do? You know, we going to sit there? No, we didn't have iPhone. We didn't have any of that <laughs> stuff back then. And, but at the same time, it's like yeah, we probably should have known better. You know, we did a lot of that stuff in our rooms, but when we were traveling, you bored, you 
he just wanted to, you know, have some fun. Mm -hmm. We pulled out the deck of cards. We stopped playing Tonk or Spades or whatever. Yeah. We're just having fun. What were fans like? I can't even imagine guys, y'all flying commercial now. Oh, my what, God. What were fans like back then? It was absurd. <laughs> but it was new to me, so I was like, okay. And you, okay, my rookie year, you know, they gave all the rookies middle seats. <laughs> that was part purpose. of the hazing. Oh, rookie. my goodness. And there's always a and little you're bait. flying coach. We're flying coach. Oh, oh yeah. Gosh, the that's... vets get first class. Rookies get coach. Now, it, did, it wasn't based on how good you were, right? Oh, no. it, was, it was total seniority. It don't matter who you are. All of us had to do it. But they specifically made Frank Furtado, who was who handled all that stuff, yep. put them in middle seats. <laughs> <laughs> so every time we, we got on the plane, it's the middle seat. Oh, <laughs> so man. we said that we don't know anybody. You mind switching with me? <laughs> <laughs> but it seemed like every time we flew, there was somebody with a baby. <laughs> oh my goodness! And we flew. You know, like now, you know, they stay overnight, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, all kinds of stuff. We had to catch the first flight out. So we're getting four o'clock wake up calls. Oh, you know, morning of the game. Yes, right? Sometimes morning of the game, four o'clock wake up call. So it didn't matter if we had the game the next night or in a couple of days. You catch the first flight out to be in the next city. Wow. So I remember we played in Denver and got snowed in. And we had a game against Houston. Right? Yep. But the game against Houston was two days later. Okay. So we got to Denver on a Saturday. Uh, I mean, on Friday, played Saturday, thinking we're going to wake up and go out Sunday afternoon. Yep. Oh, no. They're calling everybody. Flights are canceled. We're snowed in. So we stay in Denver. Sunday, snow came down like, like in a movie. Monday, we're still there. Tuesday is the game. We... we they call in the league. We don't know if yeah, we're going to yeah, be able to yeah. get out to play the game. So finally, the snow let up. We had to fly. Um, the starters went out first. Then the bench players. Really? Yes. That's how so we flew So different out. flights. Yes, different flights because we couldn't get everybody on the same wow. flight. And so it's funny because I still remember, like, when we finally made it to the arena and all that, the coaches still hadn't gotten there. So oh, Bernie, Big, all them guys are running out, <laughs> tying their tie. The game's already going on. So you started the game with the no coach? The game started well, with you no coach. Head, you didn't even have the head coach? <laughs> the game what? started. The game started. Was there any any authority figure there? They, like, who was? I think we had one. No, I'm not saying we didn't have any coaches. Okay. I think we had one. I think but Bernie the was there. I think Bernie there. was there. But the assistants came in because they wow. had some with us. And so we all running out, players you know, we still like, we have dress. <laughs> We're running out there. So they started the game with just a five. And we scattering, you know, the next one come in. And all of a sudden, our bench started filling up. It was like the craziest thing, wow. man. Wow. And because we didn't have a private plane. It's like charter. That's okay, can we get on? Can we get, I mean, can we get on this flight? <laughs> so when you got charters, it was like a whole new oh world. Oh, my goodness. Oh, and then the gambling was right there. Before we even took off, there were already people down $5,000. <laughs> It's like, wait a minute, we're not even in the air yet. Are you down five grand? <laughs> What's the, I don't know if it's best, biggest, worst gambling story you ever saw? Like a guy just loses his shirt. You ain't got to name names, but Shoot, you want the to, one that made, The one we had first. I mean, I have a ton. I got to say some of this for my book. <laughs> but um, <laughs> the one that made pop, uh, the news oh, um, uh, with Dale Ellis and Xavier McDaniel. Yeah. That's the biggest one. Yeah. I mean, actual fight. I mean, it was crazy. And that was one of those days. You know, we were flying out. And again, before we left the ground, he's down like five, ten grand. Which one was down? Dell. Okay. He was down by five, ten grand that fast. So he got, you know, got some money wired to him. I think we were going to Phoenix. So got money sent to him, more gambling. So long story short, they, um, X is like, I want my money. You know, this is days later. Okay. And we had a rule amongst our team. When we get back to our home city, you know, you have until the next day. Because yeah. you're home now. You can go to your bank yeah. and get the yeah. money. If we're on the road, we understand. Well, a couple of days go by, there's no money. So we had a uh, uh, practice. X stood up. It's like, yo, man, I want my money. It's like, man, you get your money when you get your money. What'd you say? 
bap. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> he just clocked him. So what, now Dale was a tough dude. Dale was so a what tough dude, but that? he jumped up. They start swinging. I grab one. I'm always in, involved <laughs> breaking up fights. I grab one. Derek McKee and Nate McMillan grab another. Uh, Gary grabs somebody. We all like just holding on to people. And KC and everybody walks in. It's like, what, what, what's going on? <laughs> Man, they talking, yelling back and forth. He's like, all right, everybody go home. Practice canceled. <laughs> we were just stretching. Wow. We hadn't even started practice. Practice is canceled. Wow. So Dale runs out, grabs a two by four. <laughs> He's ready to swing. So we have X in the back. And everybody's standing there. We're not letting Dale get in. We're not letting him come out because he wants to come out yeah, and fight. Yeah. So I'm like, oh, my goodness. So <laughs> finally, sent him on home, right? We squashed everything, yeah. so we thought. So here they come. So now Dale somehow finds out that X is going to be at the office, at the uh, team office, because they want to meet with them. Oh, the off team wants yeah. the office wants to meet with the So team. X had his baby, newborn baby at the time, right in the elevator <laughs> with one of our um, interns or video guys. Yeah. So Dale walked into the into the building and saw X as soon as the elevator opened. While he's on the baby, bap, clocked him with a. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't one of these cell phones. It was the brick. Remember the brick oh, cell yeah, phone? Those yeah, big he users. clocked him in the head <laughs> with the cell phone. While he's holding his baby. baby. <laughs> he's like, uh, that's this again. I'm tell, I'm relaying what uh, Paul said, the yeah, video yeah. guy. So X said, "Hold my baby." <laughs> so because Dale hit him and took off. <laughs> Hold my baby. He held the baby, <laughs> chased him, <laughs> slammed him against every car that was there. <laughs> Dale, he was living there. Wow, wow. <laughs> And wow. So they basically, after that incident, they traded everybody. <laughs> <laughs> All of us got people that went, I'm like, I got traded. I'm, like, I'm not involved in this. <laughs> Literally, they traded, they traded Dale, they traded X, they traded Tom Chambers, they traded me, they traded Sedell, they traded everybody. It's like, wow. we just, okay, we're just going to have... Um, Gary, Sean, <laughs> y'all can stay the rest of you. <laughs> wow, that's that's interesting. That is in well, you, you, I mean, gosh, you said so much. Gary Payton, what was he like in his earliest? Because we know the legend of Gary Payton, what he became, yeah. and all that. What was he like as a young guy? That wasn't. It took him a few years to even, you know, to play. Yeah, it a took high him level. a while. He was really brash, talking out the side of his ear, and um. We saw that early on, and so we 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 went at him, even as teammates. Yep. You know, we went at him, and because we knew he had some limitations. Yeah. One being his jump shot. Yeah. I don't think he would have become what he became if he didn't have the perseverance that he did. Because I still remember the playoff series against the Lakers. Magic embarrassed him. I mean, they embarrassed all of it because they swept us. Yeah. But li personally. He was guarding him. Every time Gary caught the ball, he basically ran under the basket. Just left him by himself. Wow. And he, he couldn't make shots. Wow. And that summer, he just took it upon himself. I think that was the game. That was the defining moment in his career. Mm. You know, mm. you're never going to embarrass me like that again. Literally, like, he caught the ball, magic ran back. <laughs> not guarding you. Like, turn his back on him type oh, stuff. Wow. I'm not guarding you. Wow. <laughs> and he didn't have the present mind to drive. Yeah, yeah, just going to the basket. <laughs> he was young. Wow. So he taught him, you know, you can't talk trash, you know, to certain people. Because he talked yeah, young, he talked, even though he, he wasn't that good. He came in talking trash, thinking that was the way he was supposed to be. I'm from Oakland, da 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 Nah, that's, that's not going to work yeah, right now. Yeah. You got to have a game. Yeah. You know, you got to be able to back it up with your game in the NBA. You might get away with that at Oregon State, but it wasn't happening here. Yeah. But he learned from that, and he became the glove. What about Rodman? That must have been my wild, favorite man. teammate. Really? My favorite teammate. Why? He just he knows how to play the game. Smart, hard worker. You know, he plays forty minutes and then gets in the gym right after the game, do another hour workout. I mean, he was incredible. I, 
I mean, borderline psycho, of course, but <laughs> as far as the workouts, because <laughs> yeah. I'm like, I'm too tired to be doing another hour of workouts. <laughs> After the game. Yeah, I'm talking about a work, a full workout. After a game. Yes. Did you ever ask him why he does That's, it? That was his thing. That was his thing. You know, he's like, he want to stay in shape. And I'm like, I'm exhausted watching you work out. Wow. wow. So, but he was really a good guy. Nothing he wouldn't do for you. You know, he definitely got a bad rap, you know, with everything that was going on because he was, he's, he's like super genius when it comes to rebounding. Oh, yeah. And knowing how to play the game. He's super genius. Wow. And so, you know, I think he got caught out there like with the whole, with him and Madonna, mm -hmm. that whole, there's no such thing as bad publicity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He got really, you know, yes, there is bad publicity. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Trust me on that. There's bad publicity. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Today, let's let's go to the playoffs. Because you, you said, I think on the herd, a week or so, a week or two ago. A couple weeks ago. That Boston is going to win the East. Yes. Is that correct? Yes. Why do you think they're beating Cleveland? They're beating Cleveland for the simple fact that they're a much better team. You know, bottom line is Brad Stevens has empowered his guys. When Gordon Hayward went down, no one panicked. And people didn't even see that. It's like, oh, my God, oh, he's yeah. hurt. He's down for the year. No, they rallied around. They should have won even that first game. Mm -hmm. So, But they rallied around. They ran like 16 in a row. And then Kyrie gets hurt. No one panics. Terry Rozier, you step in there. Jalen Brown, you step in there. And Brad has empowered those guys. The same shots Kyrie was getting. Terry, you get. The mm -hmm. same shots Gordon was getting, Jalen, you get. A lot of coaches don't do that. A lot of coaches, they minimize their players. They, you know, they emasculate them. You know, instead of pushing them to greatness, they don't, you know, Brad Stevens is allowing his players to be great. Mm -hmm. He's allowing them, the young guys, to make mistakes and learn from the mistakes. And I think they got a steal in Jason Tatum. Oh, yeah. No My question. goodness. He's that's phenomenal. ridiculous. But their length and size and the fact that they have this toughness that the Cavaliers can't match. Okay. They so got six guys they can rotate on LeBron. Yeah. So what do you say? How many games is this going? I said five. Boston and five. I, I'm sticking with it. My producer is like a huge Boston man. He is just he's just <laughs> eating this up. He's like, <laughs> I, hey, I, I don't ever change my predictions or what I say, you know. And I said Boston in five, Boston in five. And I call, I told people Toronto was not going to beat. Nah, they didn't want to. Because they don't have the mental makeup, yeah. you know. But definitely Boston does. They're a lot tougher than Cleveland. So in the West, who you got? I have the Warriors in five. five. Okay, so what about the finals? Finals is the Warriors. And I don't want to say they're going to sweep them. I think Boston gets one game. So I say Warriors in five okay. again. Okay. If, five is a good number. <laughs> <laughs> in your predictions, either even if LeBron gets to the finals, there, let's say he doesn't win the championship, which is highly unlikely that he does. What do you think he should do this offseason? I think he should stay in Cleveland, finish out his career. So no, don't worry about rings. No, anything. because you have rings. Um, I think if he goes away again, it, it's going to tarnish his legacy. Really? Yes, because – you had a point now. I understood the Miami thing because you hadn't won. I can understand one time. Then you went back to Cleveland. You you didn't leave Miami and go somewhere else. You went yeah. back. Yeah. You can't do that again. That's gonna look really whack now if you start mm. doing that. Mm. It'll be interesting. It'll be interesting. Stay in Cleveland. You can't come to the Lakers because you have better plays in Cleveland than you do with the Lakers. Well, if he went there with Paul George. Uh, if my aunt had testicles, she'd be my uncle. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, 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 on that note, um, I want to ask you, we talked about it last night, the, you still play. You're 54 years old Man, and you still play. No, I don't play. Well, you went out for I, the big three, I, right? I, I took Try part it. in the big three tryout because, one, I really am impressed with what they've done. And I saw it as a way to kind of like get back into the game a little bit. It didn't turn out the way I wanted, but I still wanted to see what I could do. And when I found out that I was, you know, taking part in the combines, I only had like a three week lead time to get in shape. Mm. And I hadn't played basketball in 12 years. You know, I hadn't run up and down a court in 12 years. <laughs> 
I was 40 pounds. I still am about 40 pounds <laughs> over my playing weight. <laughs> so, but it was just to see if I could do it. So within two and a half weeks, I got myself in a little bit of shape, lost about 15 pounds in two weeks, Whew. got in the gym. I dunked the basketball, okay. which I hadn't done in 12 years. <laughs> Man, my body was like, what are you doing right now? <laughs> and so I went out there, and I did really well. You won the one-on-one, -on -one, right? I won the one-on-one -on -one against all the big guys. And I'm talking about guys that are like 31, 32, that could still probably be in the league if they had some kind of mental toughness. Wow. Because that's the thing. They do have some young guys. That, guys that had only a cup of coffee in the league, yeah. right? But they're and young. It's like, yeah, but I'm like, dude, try work on your game. If this is your craft, work at it. They don't do that. And that's what's so pr surprising to me. And when I won the one-on-one -on -one competition, I knew I was going to win. But I was like, <laughs> wait a minute. This was not as hard as I thought. Because wow. they were going for all the pump fakes. I'm like, dude, I'm not dunking the basketball. <laughs> Why are you jumping? <laughs> Their IQ is kind of low. You, you know? think that's just a plague of today's generation oh, yeah, of players? Definitely. You know, it's like the old saying, youth is wasted on the young. Mm -hmm. And we get to see it a lot more in, bas in, in sports because the way to get, in, to get experience is to go through it, to experience it. But, you know, if you don't experience it and learn from your experiences, then you're doomed for failure because mm -hmm. you're going to keep repeating the same mistakes. And I, that's what I saw during the tryouts that a lot of these guys, they made so many mistakes when they were in the league, even if it was for a short amount of time. Even now, they're still doing the same mistakes. They're just not thinking. Yeah. And I'm like, dude, I'm 54. There's no way I should be scoring this ugly hook shot on you. <laughs> I'm not even jumping off the ground. Wow. Now, what? <laughs> so what do you think, what's the better, there's always the discussion, what era was better? Your era where obviously were dominant bigs or this era where they're shooting all the threes? This era is better. This is the one I like. Really? Aesthetically more pleasing. Ours was WWF wrestling, yeah. man. Yeah. With guys that could shoot the ball. That's all it was. It was wrestling. <laughs> you know, Vince McMahon, I think, was our commissioner. <laughs> Come on now. It's ridiculous. Now, you know, they might not be as tough as people want to say, you know. And I think the reason we say that is because we're so used to seeing you know, Oakley, Mason, mm -hmm. Ewing, and that, those guys, everybody scrapping. We don't appreciate the beauty of what's going on right now. And that's why I love San Antonio. I love the Warriors. I love watching those teams because it's a thing of beauty to watch. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. those crisp passes, jump shots. I'm wide open. It's, man, please. I'd rather watch this, this game right now All as right. a fan. Better players now? I'm not saying that. Okay. <laughs> no, I'm not saying better play. I'm just saying it's aesthetically better. <laughs> better players then. Better players then. Really? We okay. were more fundamentally sound. Yeah. I'll give our era that because we had 12. I think we had 12 back then. All 12 could play. Yeah. Now you have 15. You're hoping to have five, six guys that could play. The rest just make up the team. And that's the sad part. Mm. And the other thing about our era if you got hurt, you losing your job. That's why we all played hurt. Because I'm not taking a chance of this guy coming off the bench and me not being able to get my job back. Wow. You wow. know? So we played through all the injuries. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I can't give up my job. Now, they get hurt, come back, job's still available. <laughs> <laughs> Let me ask you this last question before you go. Go back to 2000. I've always wanted to ask you this. You were you had the incidents where you were impersonating a police officer. So they say. So the, yeah. So tell I'm me, glad clear you the air, up. clear the air. You know what? <laughs> I, I've paid a heavy price for that, and it's not even close to what happened. Mm. Not even close. Okay. And I thank you for bringing this up. <laughs> and I didn't even know you were gonna bring it up, but in my mind, I was like, please let him ask about this. Please let him ask about <laughs> this. So, I'm with the Utah Jazz, and we just got done with practice. I have a jet black Mercedes Benz, tinted windows with California license plates. That could never, ever be mistaken for anything but a Mercedes Benz. <laughs> I pull out of our practice facility and I'm driving. I'm going to see a young lady. Maybe that was the reason 
I don't know. <laughs> you know, maybe that was punishment. Uh -huh. But so I'm on the phone with her. I had two cell phones. I had a black cell phone and I had that new Nextel that flipped up like the Matrix phone. Okay, okay. So I'm on the phone. I'm on the black cell phone with her and the other one sitting in the chair. And so I'm driving this car. You know, the lane started to become one because they were cones. So the car swipes me like this, clips my car. I felt them hit me. Mm. and kept going and made a right turn. So I'm like, oh, snap, you know? So I made the right turn. I'm thinking he's gonna stop so we could, you know, exchange numbers and mm -hmm. all that. He keeps going. So I keep going. I pick up the black phone, I say, hey, let me call you back, you know? Yep. And so, and I'm like, oh, you know what? No, 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 I want you to stay on the phone. She's like, what happened? I said, um, I just got hit, you know? All right, hold on. So I grabbed the other phone and I called 911. I called the police, they put me on hold. So I'm like, okay, I'm calling the police right now, they got me on hold, okay, fine. So while all this is going on, he makes a U-turn and parks in the house. It's his house. So you followed him. I followed all the way. So I make a U-turn and now my driver's side is facing him. Okay. He comes out. Tell him he's a gangbanger from California. <laughs> wow. Apparently they had called the police too. So I'm like, I'm a gangbanger. So he, he don't know you from anybody. He, he doesn't know me from that, anybody. Yeah. So the lady who he was with comes out. We're calling the police, right? Get them out of here. So I'm like, I got the police on the phone now, you know? It's like, yeah, he's a gangbanger from California. I'm like, dude, if I was a gangbanger, you'd be dead right now, <laughs> right? So I yell out, I'm old and polonese of the Utah Jazz. So now he realizes I'm not a gangbanger and all that stuff. He walks up to my car. It's like, dude, what's going on? It's like, yo, you hit my car. It's like, no, I didn't. I said, my man, you hit my car. When you made that right turn, you mm -hmm. clipped my car. It's like, oh, man, I didn't even realize it, man. I'm sorry. Like, yeah. So my wallet is sitting in my driver's seat, okay. in my passenger seat, and it's open. I had a little pin, right? that was given to me by, by my agent, you know, and he gave me one, he gave Carl Malone one, he gave uh, Danielle Marshall one, and he gave Brian Russell one, because okay. he represented all of us. And it was from Chef Lee Baca. It's just like a little commemorative pin, okay. like the size of a nickel. It's in my, you know, like if you ever get pulled over, you, yeah, you know, yeah, you open yeah, it up, they it. see it, yep. and then they let, you know, whatever, they give yep. you a courtesy. He sees that, he's like, why do you have that? I said, none of your effing business. Right? Yeah. That was it. So I'm still waiting on the police to come back. You know, that's all I said to him. I said, yo, dude, you know, do you want to exchange information? What do you want to do? It's like, man, I don't think I hit your car, but, you know, if, we, you, know, if you want to exchange information, like, yo, let's exchange information. So we exchanged information. That was it. I left. Police never came back on the phone. I go home. Okay. I never even bothered to go see who I was going to see. Yep. I just ended up going home because I'm like, this is crazy. A week later, they're telling me I'm being charged with impersonating a police officer. Wow. And so I'm like, huh? What the hell's going on? Now, there's never, there's no police, there's nothing. So I talked to the team. I talked to Jerry Sloan and um, Kevin O'Connor, who was the GM at the time. The assistant DA came in and we had a meeting. And I explained, every, just like I said to you, I explained what happened, and I showed it to him. Okay. You know, he's like, is that what we're talking about? I said, this is exactly what, what happened. He's like, don't even worry about it. I'll take care of it. Mm. Mm. Next thing I know, they filed charges. The, the pe person that hit yes, you? Yes, they filed charges. The district attorney filed charges. I'm like, wait a minute, how is that taking care of it? You filing charges now. Oh, the DA filed charges. The DA, charges. yes. At first, it was just a report. Yeah, yeah. Then they filed charges. So the team had another meeting with me. It was like, hey, maybe you should just take a, a deal. You know, I don't think you want to go through this during the season. Da, 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 da. Look out for the team. And me being the dummy that I was looking out for the team, <laughs> I copped the plea deal, which I shouldn't have done. I should have just went to trial yeah. and dealt with it then. Wow. Wow. And so that's it. So that's bothered you for a It's bothered all this, me for, since 2000. Yeah. Because, you know, I get people laughing at me. Oh, you know, hey, police officer. I'm like, <laughs> are you for real? Wow. Wow. <laughs> and that's, I mean, that's it in a nutshell.
Oh, That's exactly what happened. Because he saw that little thing in my wallet. He asked me what it was. And then he, he re, relayed that to them. He said, well, I saw he had a badge in his, mm. in his wallet. Mm. But when I showed it to the DA, mm. it's the size of a nickel. Now, I know what you're talking about. Yeah, it's if like, I, cops give you something and yeah, say Yeah, but I never, I never said anything about police. I never did anything. All I said was, none of your business. Wow. <laughs> so I. <laughs> well, I'm glad you got to clear that up here on In the Zone, hey. and uh, we glad we could provide you the platform. But great, I, I great appreciate interview, it, man. great I stories. Appreciate it. We appreciate. I know, I knew you'd be good because I love hearing <laughs> you interview because you. Oh, thank you. You got great stuff. So there it is, In the Zone, thank Old you. and Polonies, 15 year NBA yeah. veteran. Don't believe and, everything you hear. <laughs> <laughs> All right, here we go for another segment of one of my favorite parts of the podcast. I welcome in. You let me Jay back in Mac this week yeah, after yeah, last week. Yeah, I thought beef. about it. I felt bad Square about <laughs> beating you down. Okay. Um, I let you back. So another segment of knockdown, yes. Jay. What you got for uh, me? Listen, you're uh, feeling good because your Celtics playing well. I'll give you props and on that. The Rockets. I think you said they have a 40, 45 percent no, chance. No, no, I said 25. 25. Okay, zero yeah, percent chance. <laughs> but let's start with uh, your Cavs. Your guy LeBron. There is a somber mood out there right now. Like. Are, are they dead? Is this series over? And Chris, I got to say, they've lost two games by double digits. They can't make three-pointers to save their life. Defensively, they're getting shredded. Nothing from the backcourt. I know there's a few days off and they're going home. Brad Stevens, his coach, circles around Ty Lue. I don't see an argument for the Cavs in this series other than, well, they have LeBron. I think the series is over. Do you? No, no, no. It's too, look, Boston looks great. All props to them, all props to Brad Stevens and the players. They need to start getting some respect, too. But, look, Boston has been bad on the road in the playoffs. This is true. 9-0 and at home, 1-4 and on the road. And the one game they did win against Philadelphia, come on, the Sixers kind of threw Gave that away. Gave that away, that's okay, true. Okay, so you're going to Cleveland. You got the best player in the world. And the role players for both teams play better at home. If you look at Terry Rozier, who was great again in game two, in the playoffs, he's averaged 20 points at home, 13 on the road. He shot 45% from three at home, 24% on the road. You look at Al Horford, 20 points at home during the playoffs, 12 on the road, 30% shooting from three on the road. Jalen Brown even goes from 18 points down to 16. So the players in Boston, the role players, and even the young leaders and stars aren't going to be as good on the road as they have been at home. Let me so jump in. Can I jump I in with a pushback? I think can come back. Okay, I would, I, no dispute of anything you said. However, this is a Cavs team that got blown out at home against Indiana in game They're one. They're five and one right? at home. And they needed a buzzer beater against a bad Toronto team. Bad? Well, they won I mean, 59 games. I mean, the Cavs led that game by double digits most of the way and let Toronto creep back in. I believe that was a game without DeRozan. Remember the fourth quarter? They kind of subbed well, him out. Wasn't, there was some he, drama. DeRozan was there. He, was, he, yeah, he just got played, benched because he, he wasn't playing Okay, he well. got benched. So Toronto got back in that game. LeBron won at the buzzer. So it's not like Cleveland is unbeatable at home. No, right? we I mean, they're not this. a right. terrific team, but they're 5-1 and one at home. They okay. play much better. They were 3-2. and two. Now they're 3-4 and four on the road in the playoffs. Okay. So they're going to play much better. Boston's not going to play as well. Again, you got the best player. Look, last night you could argue game two was more of a must win for Boston than for Cleveland because considering that the Celtics play so poorly on the road, if they lose last night, then they probably go back to Boston for game five down 3-1, and now you're facing elimination. So, look, all LeBron has to do is win one game in Boston. It could be game five. It could be game seven. It doesn't matter. But he just has to win Wait, one but, game. But, but when you say that, you make it sound like these next two are going to the Cavs. No, I'm not, it's not automatic. Look, Boston's playing great. Okay. I mean, there's no doubt about it. But I'm just saying it's not over. Like, for us to be acting like, oh, it's, there's no chance Cleveland can win, that's ridiculous. Because, again, best player, you got home court. And, look, LeBron James, when he says, I'm not concerned, He's not just 
blowing smoke. <laughs> this is a guy that was down 3-1 to the best regular season uh, team in history. He had Kyrie Irving. Draymond but got suspended. you're still down 3-1. And Man. they still, I give you that, that Draymond suspension completely changed the momentum. And they had Kyrie how, Irving how, on that team. No question. Right. He was great. However, you still had to win two games with Draymond on the floor in Golden State. At the same time, LeBron looks around this roster, okay? Jordan Clarkson did not oh, play yeah, in he's game not two. Getting the help. He, I mean, he's done. But Rodney Hood can't play, okay? George Hill is an embarrassment to watch play, okay? Kyle Korver cannot defend Jalen Brown. They just went right at Kyle Korver, had to play him off the court, okay? So I don't see the supporting cast. This is two losses on the road by double digits. Well, look, it's not Neither a, game was it's close. It's not a and great hold on, well, my last no, no, game. Hold on. La game two was close. Oh, my gosh. The Cavs didn't I mean, get you can't. Look, it's like saying the Houston-Golden State game wasn't close because it was double fifth. It was close. <sighs> it was a competitive game. In the three-point era, toward the end of the game, you can you can go okay. ahead and if end up winning by double figures. If you don't lead in the fourth or you're not in one, within one possession, I don't consider that close. I do. I mean, oh, they okay. were within five points. Did you with at what? any point? How, they were within five points with, what, six minutes left okay. or something but like at that? at any point, did That's you think, close. all right, That's Cavs two possessions. look good, they're running good offense, I think they got this. At any point, did you think the Cavs were going to win that game last night in the fourth quarter? Well, I mean, they're down, but I, it was a close game. Mm -hmm. Within reach is my point. Okay. It wasn't a one-possession game, but it was within reach. And, again, LeBron's been down numerous times, mm -hmm. not just the Warriors, down 3-2, in the finals against San Antonio, remember in 2013, yeah, yeah, down 3-2, going to Boston in the Eastern Conference Finals against the big three Celtics. Mm -hmm. And he plays great and they win the series. So Let me hear I'm your new saying. pick for the series. I'm sticking no, I'm with stick, Celtics I'm in sticking seven. with my pick. Cavs in. I said six. I'll stick with it. Wow. All right. Let's There's move no on need to, 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 to the away. Celtics. Uh, listen, uh, you've been pushing this angle, Chris. I, I got to say, I've sent you a couple of upset text messages about it. Uh, Chris, come on. The Boston Celtics won 55 games with Gordon Hayward not playing. And he's a top 20 player in the NBA. I don't think we'd argue that. We uh, would argue that. Right. Top we, 20? Okay, we won't argue he's that. He's a one-time All-Star. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, I mean, there's a reason they paid him $130 million last They paid Al Horford that, Everybody too. Was he won top 20 when well, they Al did Horford's that? older. I mean, Gordon Hayward's in his prime. Was he top 20 when they gave him that money? No. Okay. Uh, Gordon Hayward is a tw was a 26-year-old <laughs> guy don't, on the rise. Don't come to me with contracts. Oh, my God. Okay, fine. <laughs> 55 wins, no Gordon Hayward. Kyrie misses the, you know, the end of the season. Next year, this is a team that's going to dominate the East. I know your Sixers are going to be there. Assuming LeBron leaves, this is a 60 to 65 win team next year when you add in Kyrie and Hayward. I think under no circumstances should they tinker and go after Kawhi or trade Kyrie. Your bench, your three guys off the bench next year are looking at Rozier, probably Marcus Smart, and Marcus Morris. I mean, those are huge contributors now. They're going to have maybe, after the Warriors, the best starting lineup in the NBA next year. Why on earth? Would you trade anybody from this team? And, and let's please stop with the Gordon Hayward trade ideas. He, uh, nobody's trading for a guy coming off that injury. That is just not happening. Oh, go ahead. We're not going to stop with the <laughs> Gordon Hayward trade ideas. <laughs> Look, boss is going to be great. If they don't touch a thing, they will be a very good team. But you cannot rest on your laurels in this NBA. There have been a lot of very good teams. The Phoenix Suns with Steve Nash never won it. Sacramento with Chris Webber and Paige Stoyakovich and all those guys never won it. Like, just because you get close, you don't say, okay, we're there. If they get beat, if they get to the finals and get beat four games, five games, whatever, then you can't sit there and say we're close to going. Well, you State. can because you Even, haven't seen it with Kyrie and Hay it, Hayward. You're you two best it. players. So that doesn't mean everything might not fit. Roles are going to be different now. When Kyrie comes back, Jason Tatum is now of a different stature. Jalen Brown is now of a different stature. I think both of them are better than Gordon Hayward. They're better defenders. Their, their potential is way better. Potential, yes. But you but tell even me right now, now. Jason Tatum is a 43% three-point shooter. Uh, Gordon Hayward is a 36% career three-point shooter. Gordon Hayward gets yeah. you four rebounds a game as a six. Uh, I need a timeout. Oh, no, no, no. I, oh my gosh. I listen to you. No, I'm getting as heated. a six-eight player, Gordon Hayward gets you four rebounds a game for no. his career. 
Jason Tatum got five me five last. this year as a rookie. Look, hey, let's not go career numbers on Hayward because as a rookie, barely played. Well, that La- said, hold on, that year said something too. 21-5. Let me, let me finish. Okay, okay, okay. Talent. Jason Tatum is a better talent than Gordon Hayward, and it's showing by the fact that he's contributed right away. Do you know who the youngest player ever, ever, that includes Michael Jordan, J- LeBron James, Kobe Bryant, Shaquille O'Neal. The youngest player ever to lead his team in scoring in the playoffs and get them to the conference finals is who? I'm going to guess it's Jason Tatum. Jason no, Tatum. Okay. Right. So this guy, you're putting he's his, awesome. he's doing, cr- so I think this is what I do. Again, I like them if they come back just as they are. But LeBron James might go to Philadelphia. Now all of a sudden, you got to deal with them. And I don't think you can say definitively that that's a really good team, but are you definitively better than them? I don't think you can say that. So here's here's what I would do. I told you. I would call the Spurs. My first offer, Terry Rozier, Gordon Hayward, next year's Kings pick. Hold on, hold on. That's a lot for Kawhi Leonard. Oh, man. Uh, is that not a lot? I would not. I would not even. I would. There's no way Danny Ainge would do that. No Why? way. He. This is a guy who didn't want Jimmy Butler. He passed on Paul George. He's gonna want Kawhi Leonard Why would coming off want that Kawhi injury. Leonard? When you've got all this awesome. You're talent. giving up a guy coming off an injury, so it's kind of a. You have even switch. There's a reason Danny Ainge went full board to get Hayward. Now here's why. You, me, wait. You don't think he'd want Kawhi Leonard over Gordon Hayward? And, well, Gordon Hayward, Terry Rozier, and and the Kings' number one pick, which could be a top five pick. Kawhi Leonard is like. Eight years no, ahead no, of Gordon Hayward. That's true. Okay, let me now. So you got to throw in some some stuff to I would, make it work. I would work. never do that. Okay, so uh, let's. And then let me. Uh, go, no, go ahead. What else? All right. Because uh, I'm going to sound Here's the off other here. thing, and I would not, I would not want to trade Kyrie. However, oh, no. Kyrie Irving has a player option after next year, mm-hmm. so he could be a free agent. Guess what team was not on his list? Boston. Yeah. Okay. Miami, San Antonio. New York and Minnesota were the teams on his. So what if I don't trade Kyrie Irving and he decides to walk and I get nothing for him? I'm just saying you might have to explore it because of the fact that he could walk away for nothing a year from now. There's already, you know, people wonder. I've wondered. How does Kyrie feel watching this team yeah, go I, this far that. without I mean, him? And I'm not saying he's selfish. He's not selfish, but he's human. He's human. And right. you, if you're a superstar, you want to be a big part of the, th- the team and you want to feel needed. So my point is, rather than risk losing Kyrie for nothing, do I look at, you know what? I, if I can get Kawhi Leonard and, and obviously get a promise for him that he'll stay, I'd hate to see Kyrie go, but I think that's something you have to explore okay. just because of the circumstances. I think the Kyrie stuff has more merit than your Hayward that, that stuff. That totally spooked you. you you're like, no, stumped. I did not. No, no, next, I think it's go a, to your it, next no, time. No, oh, time out. <laughs> Hold up. I got to respond to this Gordon Hayward stuff. Okay. We saw last year what Brad Stevens can do to anybody on the roster. Avery Bradley was a star in Boston. Isaiah Thomas. Hold on, no, 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 no. Don't, you had don't your overstate. J- Jay star. Crowder. All these guys don't looked overstate. awesome. Jay with, Crowder. With awesome. Jay, Hold on. Jay Crowder was great last year. Hold on. Avery Bradley was a star, was a, was, and Jay Crowder was Jay, awesome. Avery Bradley. Tone it down. Avery Bradley was one Avery of the best Bradley two-way was, guards in the NBA last year. Was a great defender. Was a two-way. And played pretty well. He was He played well. He averaged 18 points a game. He was one of the best two-way guards in the league. That qualifies as star. I would go there. No, he was. Has he, he ever made an star? all-star team? I didn't say all-star. all-star. I said star. Team. Hold up. The all-star team is for all the stars. Hey, come on, dude. Was he ever? Has he ever been in it? I, I have no idea. Has he? No. Okay, fine. Not I, at close. any rate. Bre- Jay Crowder, awesome. Just no, bring it down to good. Jay Crowder was awesome in Boston, Chris. He was perfect. They loved him. They got to the conference finals. Cut. No, 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 no cut. I'm, no cut. I'm close Time to out. kicking you off cut. again. Again? <laughs> you didn't even make, let me Jay think Crowder was awesome for Boston last year. He was a very good role player. Okay, awesome. Let me finish my point. LeBron so, is awesome. Brad's, uh, Kevin Durant is awesome. Okay, let me move on. What Brad Stevens is able to do to marginal players, Jay Crowder, Isaiah Thomas, Avery Bradley, elevate their play. What he's done this year for Tatum and Brown has been incredible. They're not marginal players. No, they're very they're good. Top at, he's three already picks. made them excellent. What do you think he's going to do for Gordon Hayward? I know. An awesome player in Utah where he averaged 21 and 5, where his point guard was who? George Hill last year? Now he's going to be playing well, with he Kyrie Irving. The ball a lot yeah, he did. He's going to be playing in the Brad Stevens system with Kyrie Irving and two young studs and Al Horford. 
Gordon Hayward's going to be amazing next year. This team. I don't even know what his role is. If you if you start, but he's not a ball hog who needs twenty five shots a game. If you start, if you start Kyrie. Jalen Brown, Jason Tatum, yeah. Al Horford, and Gordon Hayward. You're you need some role player. Who's who's the worst of those? I, at least three of them are better than I Hayward. I hope you don't freak and out. And I would argue Horford's better than Hayward, too, how because at this, least he's a great defender. How is this not a Warriors light situation? The Warriors have Kevin Durant, uh, Clay Thompson, Steph Curry. They're all going to kill the you. Warriors Why always can't ha- you have Gordon Hayward? Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown in that role with Kyrie and then Al Horford. No, I'm not saying you can't. It's a good, don't get me wrong, it's a very good starting lineup. I just think it could be even better if you get Kawhi Leonard. Here's the thing. I, I, of those five guys, like you mentioned the deaf lineup in Golden State. Yeah. You got Andre Iguodala who plays a role. He knows he's not a star in that lineup. You got Draymond Green, yep. who is a star, but he's a role-playing yeah. star. Like, he does all the dirty work. You need that. Even when they go big and they start either Pachulia or Kevin Looney yeah. or JaVale McGee, you need a role yeah. player in your lineup. Marcus now you Morris, got Horford. Marcus Smart, I'm talking Al about in your Horford. starting lineup. Well, the starting lineup's just like eight minutes, and then you ro- work guys in and you get the rotation going. I'm just going. saying, don't think Hayward's going to come in okay. there and be the leading and one, scorer next one year. one reminder. Uh, Jason Tatum on his rookie deal. Ka- uh, Kawhi Leonard, you get him, you're going to need to pay him massive money. Jason Tatum is cheap for the next five yeah, years. Yeah, but I'd be getting rid of Hayward's contract. <sighs> I, I, it, look, it, it's, a good, it, it's a good team without a move. All right, move But I would right. try to make right. a move. Don't do anything, Danny Ainge. Call, text me before well, you make any moves. So. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's wrap up. Now, this one, this is a topic near and dear to your heart. Uh, you know, Maverick Carter, I hope you're not upset here. But this is a question about LeBron that, that's going to be asked, if, especially if they lose this series. If he can't get out of the Eastern Conference Finals against the Boston Celtics, who are heavy underdogs in this series. Well, technically they are the favorites. Well, now they're the favorites. But coming well, into the series, they were underdogs. But they're also the second seed. Okay. Against the How much seed. is LeBron's legacy damaged if he loses this series? And I have a theory, but I'll let you go first. Your podcast... Uh, Thank how you. much, or, or maybe you don't think his legacy is damaged at all? I don't think his legacy is damaged. The only place his legacy is damaged if they lose this series is in the GOAT conversation. It's not damaged. Well, that's legacy. It's man. not damaged. Well, but if he's considered the second best player of all time, I mean, that's really good. And I think that's what he is. I mean, all the other players, when you say damage his legacy, I think it means it has to pull him down. Okay. But it won't pull him down. Magic Johnson, in his second year, they lost in the first round of the playoffs, and he had Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. You know, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, right smack dab in the middle of his prime, missed the playoffs two straight years. My point is that all of the legends have had their bad moments. And this wouldn't even be a horrible moment. I mean, he doesn't have a lot of help, LeBron. He's in his 15th year. If he loses... In, in the conference finals, it's not like the worst okay, thing in the Chris, world. Okay, but Chris, does he not have help because, and again, I don't want to put words in his mouth, did he drive Kyrie Irving off? Did he drive him away from his team by saying, hey, man, this is my team, fall in line, well, you're my guy, the kid, team. all that stuff. All right. And I'm not, I'm not going to blame him. Look, Kyrie Irving made a decision he wanted to make. I'm not going to blame LeBron James okay, for well, that. You, you don't blame him at all for not going to Kyrie and saying, hey, I, hey man, I'm he, sorry he we got off on the wrong He went to Cleveland and said, don't trade him. He tried to reach out to Kyrie. Kyrie didn't want to talk to him. Well, but why didn't Kyrie want to talk to him? Because something must have happened, right? But look, you got the you got the second best player on teams all the time. Second best player in NBA. I mean, Shaq and Kobe left each other. Well, I blame Kobe for that. It it, it happens, you know. But my point is, the only place it will hurt LeBron's legacy is in the goat conversation. Because when once Michael and that's Jordan has not had once he started winning, he did not have moments. Like this, or like Dallas, or like not gonna Tragic Johnson Orlando 84? Magic series loss. No, when he we came don't. Back from I mean, baseball? he played baseball for a year and a half. Hadn't been playing basketball. Comes back, plays 17 regular season games. Averaged like 26 points, by the way. Right. I'm not gonna blame him for being rusty in the freaking playoffs. Against I mean, a against, young, young team. But now they, they had, young he had Shaquille O'Neal and Penny Hardaway, right. two all-time greats. Especially at that time, Penny was fantastic. So I'm not going I don't hold that against Jordan. And so once he started winning, he kept everybody else from winning. That's the thing you can't say about LeBron. 
Kevin Durant has won. Steph Curry has won. Dirk Gavitsky has won. And old Tim Duncan have won. All during LeBron's prime, even when he had a stacked team in Miami. That's a big argument for Jordan. And then you go here and you say Jalen Brown and Jason Tatum, two young bucks, beat LeBron. So, again, does it hurt him with Marcus, all the other Marcus legends? Morris no. But I think it, I think it just hurts him. He got 42 points. He had he he's four about? for 14 on shooting against Marcus Morris. That's in 14 series. possessions. Okay. He had 42 points in a triple Fact, double. Marcus Morris is locking him up. He okay. had 42 I'm points. I'm aware of that. Why didn't Brad Stevens <laughs> just put Marcus Morris on him the whole game? You see how since he can lock him up. I'm, take a shot I'm at just LeBron. saying, since I, I he like can, LeBron. Since he can lock him up, why yeah. ain't he guarding for 40 Listen, minutes? I'm not a skip Bayless LeBron hater. All just I'm so saying know. is this my this is it. This sums up what I'm saying. This will not hurt LeBron's legacy. It will only hurt in the GOAT conversation with Jordan. That's all I'm saying. I would counter that no matter what LeBron does, he cannot win. He's not going to win with the fans. He's not going to win with the media. He's not going to win with his teammates. He's not going to win with his peers. Because this is a guy who's doing everything. As you said, triple-double. He's amazing. Well, you know what? Points, at the man. end of the season, he's going to look at this roster and say, man, I, these, these scrubs, I can't play with these guys. I'm out of here. He goes to Houston. Oh, well, he'd have to join a 65-win team. He's a ring chaser. He goes to the Lakers. You think, oh, he's not going to win. He goes to the Sixers. Well, no, Joel Embiid, Ben Simmons, best young guys. LeBron needs that help. LeBron can't do anything to help his legacy at all. And I don't think it's fair to say. Why? Really? How, how can he help his legacy, Chris? By winning more championships. Okay, that's not happening. What? If he goes to Philadelphia, he, they're not, goes to I don't think they're getting out of the East. I mean, that's another but, discussion. But that's your opinion. I mean, you'd have to look at that team and say they got a great young point guard, a great center, and the best player in the world. And there's some shooters with Sarich and a couple other guys. They yeah. had. Like, why, uh, why Celtics couldn't are they adding, win? Celtics still have the best coach by a mile, and they're adding Gordon Hayward and Kyrie Irving. I, I'll take the Celtics who over would that be, LeBron If team. you put those two teams together, who, who would, with LeBron and Philly, who's the best player? LeBron. Okay, who's second best? Well, Embiid, you, I mean, you, Joel Embiid? Joel Embiid, really? I mean, he got outplayed by Al Horford straight up in the series. I say Joel Embiid. It was his first season. I mean, season you love Jason Tatum. I'm surprised you're not going there. I will say Kyrie Irving is the second best player in that series. Kyrie's very good. Okay. I say Embiid. Okay, the, and then right. it's, we, we saw Jason Tatum outplay Ben Simmons head to head. Is he better than Ben Simmons? I mean, I think you're sleeping uh, on this cat, uh, on this uh, Celtics team, man. N- no, I, I'm and saying the Celtics team would Gordon be good. Hayward, who but is for you, ridiculously to, talented. I know you don't like Hayward. He's a one freaking time All Star. Uh, My goodness, uh, I don't care what happened. What three years do you ago live in on? Utah with that sw- Gordon oh, Hayward is what tremendously talented. Uh, uh, Jay, Jay Crowder is awesome. Gordon Hayward uh, beat uh, Chris Paul uh, in the playoffs last year. You we love to. Avery Bradley's an all star. Like, wh- why are you saying that? All-star? So, Gordon Hayward's not good. What are you, Hold you on. got something you've I been smoking? <laughs> yeah, I mean, my goodness. Listen, uh, Chris. Avery Bradley's you know an all star. Gordon Hayward's an all time great. And Jay Crowder's all star. Can we awesome. tear up your top five and go 25 best players in the league so I can prove to you Gordon Hayward is First in the top 25? 20. Now you're uh, 20, already, you're 20, already 20 backing up. 20, qu- a top 20 player in the league, no doubt in about it. In two minutes, it'll be top Dude, 35 player in the league. He goes play with George league. Hill to Kyrie Irving. Man, I can't believe there's Gordon Hayward. The guy's Utah, played in how, six how, months. How, how much did it hurt Utah when he left? Well, Utah changed significantly. They got Donovan Mitchell, a high-impact guy. Rookie. Ru- Rudy Gobert, they have one of the better coaches well, in the league. Gobert was there last in year. Your co- yeah, he was. Your so coach was of the, the coach. year. And, uh, you know, listen, they had a good and they season. Were be- Ricky Rubio was better without Hayward, just like well, you, Ricky give, Rubio just like you like to with give Hayward. people. Ricky Rubio That's was true. in Minnesota. But he had his best year. He did, yeah. But listen, right. Quinn Snyder's a very good coach. Uh, we're forgetting, Gordon Hayward beat Chris Paul in the playoffs last year, did he not? In the first round, game seven. They went into L.A. and won, but we're getting off the... I don't know they how we're talking about Joe Johnson doing that. Oh, yeah, that's why, they, that's why they beat the Clippers. <laughs> Joe Johnson. Thank you for tuning in to bench. another no, episode no. of Knock Down <laughs> Jay, where I knocked him down big time. Nobody has more fun than us. Go to iTunes. Go to Apple Podcasts. Go to SoundCloud. Give us five stars. Leave us comments. And download, of course. See you next week. Peace. <laughs>